Okay, we're going to begin uh, the next session. I know that the session after lunch is always very tough, uh, but don't worry, we have another very intriguing and interesting uh, session prepared for you. The moderator for session six is Mr. Christopher Hinteregger, the UN WTO consultant and partner and head of Tourism Destinations International Coal and Partner from Austria. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator and the panelist with a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, perfect pronunciation of my name, even better than the first try. Um, Good afternoon, warm welcome to the sixth and last session. It's um, not only the session after lunch, it's also the last session of um, this conference. Um, that's usually a tough one, but um, I think my panelists um, have prepared um, great presentations and um, I'm sure we will add some value to this conference also, although we are at the end of it. Um, before I will start with my presentation, I, I would like to introduce my fellow panelists. Um, to the left, um, <laughs> to the left um, is Ms. Zeynep Aslan. Um, she is from the Turkish Ministry of Culture and Tourism. Um, she has a master degree uh, in city planning. Within um, the ministry, she is the tourism expert working in the department um, for planning and investment. And she's also a member of the team for ski resort development in Turkey. The next panelist um, is Alexander, Alexander Onoprishvili. He is the director of the Mountain Resort Development Company of Georgia. This is um, a state well, funded by the um, Ministry of Economy in Georgia. Um, they are responsible for all the bigger mountain resorts in Georgia, for example, Gudauri and Pakuriani. And they are responsible for doing um, the strategy. They are responsible for um, buying and installing new lifts and new tourism infrastructure facilities in the skiing resource as well as uh, investors relation. And last but not least, um, to the left, uh, to the outer left side, we have Justin Downs. Um, he's Australian. Um, he is the president of two companies. The first one is Access Leisure Management and the second one is IMG uh, Ski Resort Management. He has more than 25 years of experience and he worked on three different continents and he will share a little bit of his experience, especially on the Asian and Chinese market. So please welcome all three panelists. Thank you. I will now change my position. Perfect. Um, we are going to talk. We are going to talk a little bit um, about effective governance and tourism policy uh, in the framework of developing mountain resource. And my particular topic, as I'm from the Alpine region, is how the Alpine region deals with this topic of effective governance and policy instruments regarding mountain resource development. Who are we? Um, I work also for a company named Coal & Partner. Coal & Partner is an international consulting company. Uh, we have more than 30 years of experience. We are an Austrian-based company, but currently have offices and local um, contacts in 11 countries. We, of course, mainly focus on the European market. We are an affiliate member of the UNWTO. Uh, I'm one of the partners of the company, and I'm responsible for destination development projects outside the German-speaking markets. Um, our company is not only doing um, destination development projects or projects in mountain resource, but in tourism in general. So we have hotel development specialists, infrastructure specialists, and destination specialists. And we worked with um, almost all of the top 10 uh, Austrian mountain resource regarding destination development. But we also um, supported other emerging um, mountain resource in emerging markets like Serbia, Bosnia, Azerbaijan. So the Alpine region, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Alpine region. Um, it's a big territory. Uh, we are talking about the surface of more than 180,000 uh, square meters. Um, six countries, um, actually eight countries, um, have their share on the territory. 
Um, the biggest one being uh, Austria with a share of 29%, followed by Italy with 27%, and France with 21%. It's interesting, um, yesterday and today we heard many times that uh, South Korea is covered uh, with 64% of mountains. Austria is almost the same with 65% where I come from. In the Austrian or in the Alpine valleys, um, the public authorities very fast recognized the importance to support tourism development. Why? We heard yesterday already that um, it's quite a harsh environment to live in the valleys. Um, there's a lot of unemployment, a higher unemployment rate, and uh, a lot of people, and especially younger ones, tend to leave the valleys. So, um, for the governments uh, or the public authorities in the Alpine region, um, tourism seems to be a chance to work against this trend of um, outdated, run-down Alpine villages. So instead of having villages with only a few older people living in um, that are not very attractive, uh, we nowadays have very, very many um, very interesting and nicely and well-groomed and developed uh, mountain resort villages. Why? Because the main idea behind it was to support the local population and the local population in a way that they become local entrepreneurs. You also need to know and to understand um, the history of touristic development in the Alpine region. Um, it's not institutional investors invested into the mountain resource there. Um, it's the private entrepreneurs who started with renting out rooms of their private homes um, to potential visitors. And this industry grew and um, the amount of beds in the different facilities grew and so we definitely have a button-up approach in uh, the Alpine region regarding tourism development. So how can the public authorities support um, a professional tourism development and what have they done? I want to show and share a few examples uh, with you. The first point is definitely to have sustainable planning. One example from the province of South Tyrol, in the northern part of Italy, in the Alpine region. They have very impressive um, statistical figures. They have more than 10,000 accommodation facilities there. They have more than 218,000 beds and annual overnights of more than 28 million. Of course, um, like in other Alpine regions, the majority of the owners of the hotels are private entrepreneurs and they were on one hand, afraid that institutional investors uh, would come to their municipality or to their region and invest into large facilities that will maybe um, take away their living um, they generate from their uh, enterprises. So what the South Tyrolean government has decided in order to protect their local entrepreneurs is they have created in 2009 a law that all municipalities have to develop a tourism development plan stating exactly how many beds, maximum beds, are allowed in the municipality in order to protect the existing ones. So not all the municipalities had to do it, only those um, with overnights over a certain um, amount, but after they have done this, the government confirmed this figure and then the municipalities were allowed to allocate the additional beds for each municipalities and say whether it will be only done for enlargement of existing properties or it will be new additional plots of land made available for new developments. This should be the basis for a sustainable development, not ruining the local entrepreneurs and their good occupation, uh, occupancy rates they achieve in their destinations. The second example is from the Austrian province of Salzburg, um, almost the same amount of figures. They also have 11,000 beds, 25 million annual overnights. And like in other Austrian destinations, they face a problem regarding second homes. So because those mountain resources became uh, so popular, um, over time, a lot of people wanted to buy apartments or plots of land there to um, build their own houses. Um, this is a problem for a destination because um, on one hand it 
immensely increases um, the prices for the properties for the local people to live there or to buy um, houses or plots of land. But at the same time, it's also very difficult for the tourism infrastructure facilities like the roadway companies or the restaurants because we are talking about cold beds. So in majority of the cases, the owner of the second homes are in the mountain resort only a few times a year. And the rest of the year, they are pretty empty. And this is putting a lot of pressure on those who need the money from the visitors staying overnight, like the ropeway companies or other tourism infrastructure facilities. So what has the province of Salzburg done? They have reduced or limited, actually, the amount of second homes in each municipalities to 10%. The third example uh, is from the province of Tyrol, which is um, the most successful alpine um, destination, mountain destination in Austria. Um, as I said before, bottom-up approach, um, this is true for the hotel facilities, but this is also true for the marketing organizations or the destination management organizations. Um, they started to develop these tourism associations or destination management organizations back in the 80s. And whole Tyrol, which is not very large, they have 279 municipalities. And by the end of 1997, they had 254 different destination management organizations or tourism associations. And the Tyrolean government already understood that from a global perspective of marketing and tourism product development, um, this is definitely too many of them. So in the period between 1997 and 2003, they have started a subsidy program. So they wanted actually to give financial incentives to those destination management organizations to merge. Um, they were successful to a certain extent. Um, the number reduced to 149 by 2003, but it was still far away from the goal they had originally. So if it was not um, be able to do this uh, through subsidies, they said, okay, we will force them by law um, to reduce the number of destination management organizations. And um, by the end of 2007, they only had 39 and now only 34, which is approximately the number they wanted at the very beginning. Um, this has certain advantages regarding the marketing and the tourism product development, but at the same time, it's also very difficult. Florian from Kaunertal, um, we heard today in session four, um, some of these mergers were not done in a kind of friendly way because they were very different uh, municipalities or regions forced uh, to merge. And sometimes, um, you know, this kind of working together uh, is pretty difficult uh, still for them. Um, nevertheless, uh, from a marketing and tourism development point of view, it definitely makes sense to create bigger units. The second topic I would like um, to address is investment incentives. Um, again, the example from Austria. In Austria, we have a special tourism bank that is implementing the national um, public subsidy program. The bank was founded in 1947, so quite some time ago, and it belongs to the three biggest banks in Austria. It managed the whole um, subsidy program for the Austrian uh, Ministry of Economy, and in 2014, they had distributed um, subsidies or granted subsidies for Euro 90 million, stimulating a total investment of 780 million. So with this 90 million, private investors invested into projects for 780 million. Of course, because um, Austria, like many other um, countries in um, the Alpine region, um, is based on very small businesses in the hospitality industry, the majority of those receiving subsidies were small and medium-sized enterprises. The type of subsidies provided were non-refundable subsidies, interest subsidies, and guarantees. And the majority of the projects financed were hotel projects with 85%, mainly for small hotels to increase the capacity, so to increase the number of beds, but also quality improvement. And, uh, and this is an increasing figure, 12% for tourism infrastructure projects. And these are mainly artificial snowmaking for the mountain resource. This is only the subsidy program we have in Austria on a national level. 
But at the same time, all the nine provinces of Austria also have subsidy programs for tourism, and the European Union is also providing subsidies. So in addition to the 19 million on a national level, we also have approximately in 2014, we had another 23 million of subsidies for tourism related projects. A very similar approach in Switzerland. In Switzerland, we have the Swiss Association for Hotel Credits. Um, the main shareholders are also the banks, uh, but also um, the public sector with the Swiss government and the provinces. It's also the main goal to improve the competitiveness of the hotel industry in Switzerland. Uh, interesting is that um, they have granted more money than uh, the Austrian counterpart with 37.5 million, uh, but the total stimulated investment was 260 million, which basically means that they are financing or subsidizing larger projects than the Austrians do. Um, again, the majority of them are of the subsidies um, is used to construct new hotels and additional beds, and especially in the three and four star segment. Investment in key tourism infrastructure is another critical issue for the countries in the, Al or the destinations in the Alpine region. Um, usually, the tourism infrastructure, like the cable cars or an aqua park, they're very investment intensive which basically mean um, it's difficult for private investors to get back the money within a short period of time. And at the same time, it could be quite difficult to have liquidity when you finance those investments on a loan basis. So the public authorities understood that they need to co-finance certain important tourism infrastructure projects. Because in many destinations, the tourism infrastructure is the basis for any development. A few examples, the city of Innsbruck um, is, one of the cap is a capital of one of the provinces in Austria, um, but they are also very close to a mountain range. And um, they had a cable, cable car from the city center up to the mountain, and they needed a new one a few years ago. And because the investment Altogether, not only the cable cars, but also the mountain station and the valley station and some additional investment, uh, summed up to approximately 51 million euro. Um, this is something the private side will never invest, but it was a critical investment for um, the city of Innsbruck, um, and therefore they decided that they will implement this project as a public-private partnership project. So 27% was invested by private investors, and 73%, almost three quarter, were financed by the public side. What's the purpose, or what's the, what's, what's the advantage of the private side? They received a concession agreement uh, for 30 years so that they can have all the benefits or the profits of the company for the first 30 years. Another example from another mountain resort in Austria, Bad Hofgastein, there, they had to renovate an old aqua park and they wanted to create a new thermal aqua park. Um, the total investment was projected to be 25 million and they again developed it as a public-private partnership project where the public side invested almost half of it, 49% or 12 million. And then we have also the regional destination management organization, some banks and the brewing union from Austria. So we have some private investors, but the majority, again, comes from the public side. And they are still the owner. Uh, a few examples for roadway companies and uh, regarding their ownership, uh, who holds the shares in those uh, roadway companies. Um, in Garmisch-Partenkirchen, in Germany, for example, uh, it's 100% public. Um, it's the public transportation system, uh, public transportation company of Garmisch-Partenkirchen who is owning also all the ropeways. So it's 100% publicly owned. Zermatt in Switzerland is another example with 23%. Meran in Italy, 65%. Zerfaus Fis Ladis in Austria, also 76% ownership by the public side. And Compagnie des Alpes in France is 40% the state of France. So you see those kind of very important um, tourism infrastructure facilities are often owned or co-financed um, with the public authorities. 
And the last point I would like to mention is tourism tax, because in many countries where I do a presentation, um, they're always astonished how much money Austrian um, tourism destinations spend on tourism marketing. And um, the reason why they can do this is um, we have a very good um, system of tourism tax. Um, in Austria, we have three different levels. Um, it's the national level. Uh, we have the National Tourism Organization of Austria. Um, they are promoting Austria um, abroad. They have an annual marketing budget of around 29 million euro. Um, this is mainly funded by the Ministry of Economics and the Chamber of Commerce, and they have 220 employees. Then we have the provincial level. Um, the provincial levels, they, are, they also have um, marketing budgets between three and 20 million, depending how important tourism is in, in the province. For example, Salzburg, they have an annual marketing budget of 11 million with 50 employees. And then we have the regional level there, it's very diverse. Some have quite substantial uh, marketing budgets, others do not. Um, this depends, of course, on, on, on the destination. But how to finance this, or how is this financed? Um, here is an example um, of different kinds of tourism tax that in the most southern Austrian province of Carinthia is charged. So basically, there are three different types of tourism-related tax. They have a visitor tax. This is between 36 cents and two euro for every person arriving in the destination. The, muni the municipalities can decide the exact amount, whether it's two euro or one euro 50 or one euro. Then we have an overnight tax. This is for every generated overnight, 50 cents. And then we have a third component. We have the tourism tax. This is actually by national law um, a tax every company in Austria has to pay. There are different categories depending how close they are or how close they are to tourism or how much they are benefiting from tourism. So there are different categories, category one to category seven, and then also depending on the annual revenue of the company. So if you are a company not benefiting much from tourism, like an industry um, company, um, you will not pay much tourism tax. If you are a sport shop uh, uh, operator in one uh, of the mountain resorts, you will pay more, percentually. Um, and those three different kinds of tourism tax is then again distributed between the provincial destination management organization, the regional destination management organization, and the local tourism associations. And um, this allows them, depending on the level, to conduct the marketing activities and the tourism development project. So they can, for example, also finance some tourism-related projects with this tourism tax. Um, this is a very specific um, situation um, we have in Europe or in the Alpine region. This cannot be one-to-one -one copied to other destinations. But the key message um, of this presentation should be the government is really, uh, should be encouraged or should be proactive dealing with tourism development and then thinking about, okay, we have a certain situation in our country or destination, what can we do in order to support them? This is exactly the same the Alpine um, destination or um, public ad administrations did um, 20 to 30 years ago. And this is also one of the reasons why those destinations are so successful nowadays. This was the um, perspective, the Austrian perspective, so to say. Um, now I'm very curious uh, to find out how the situation is in Turkey and in Georgia. But first, I would like to uh, welcome Ms. Zeynep Aslan, and she will present us a little bit um, about the Turkish perspective. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, today I'll make a presentation to you about the winter tourism experience of Turkey and the act of the ministry in this experience. Uh, this is the contents of my uh, presentation. Uh, I will begin with tourism development process. Then I will uh, give you some uh, general facts about winter tourism figures. And uh, I will enter the winter tourism topic uh, with an example, with a, with a planning example of a uh, winter tourism center. And finally, I will talk about the vision uh, of mountain tourism in Turkey. 
Now I'll begin with the tourism development process. Uh, according to Turkish enc uh, tourism encouragement law, uh, some areas that have a remarkable tourism potential are declared as tourism centers. And uh, in this flow chart, we can see where the public and private sectors take place. Uh, the uh, planning pr process began with the proposal of tourism centers. The proposal can be made by public and private sectors both. Uh, if the ministry finds the proposal reasonable, uh, the declaration of tourism center uh, occurs. And after that, uh, with the declaration, uh, I should say that um, there are uh, some advantages to the investor and the, uh, to the public institutions by the ministry. And uh, after declaration, uh, the gathering physical information from the public institution phase starts. Uh, ministry uh, evaluates the gathered information and prepared analysis and synthesis maps uh, mm -hmm. to be able to determine the plan decisions and the codes. After determining the plan decisions and the codes, uh, the planning process ends with, ends with uh, approval of the plan by the ministry and announcement of the plan to the public. From gathering physical information from public institutions to announcement of the plan, uh, only public institutions takes place. And after planning process, uh, there's a land, pro uh, land allocation process. Land allocation means the ministry rents a public property uh, which is devoted to tourism usage by the approved plans. For a specific time of period, uh, it is uh, between uh, 20 uh, years to 75 years and it depends on the type of the investment. And after the land allocation, investment starts and investment uh, completed, after the investment completed, uh, the investment uh, operated by the private sector, inspected and controlled by, uh, excuse me, I said wrong, uh, the, the operated by uh, private sector, inspected and controlled by public sector. And, uh, yes. These are declared tourism centers in all over Turkey. Uh, as you can see, uh, most of the tourism centers uh, are located along the uh, Aegean coast and Mediterranean coast. I think, yes, here you can see. And other location is uh, where the uh, tourism centers are located mostly is in Istanbul because of the cultural heritage. Uh, in the graphic below, you can see the uh, you can see the declaration uh, by years, and it's been uh, very raised up after 2000. Uh, from uh, beginning, I am uh, telling you about a uh, planning uh, and uh, development process, and this process is guided by uh, tourism strategy of Turkey that targets the 2023. And uh, I should mention about the strategy uh, briefly. Uh, and the main objectives are to ensure the sustainable development of tourism, to uh, extend the, the tourism season throughout the year by diversifying tourism projects. I mean, uh, not focusing only coastal tourism. Uh, the strategy uh, aims, to pro aims to support the other types of tourism, such as we are talking about mountain tourism here or any other kinds of tourism, thermal tourism, uh, ecotourism, and etc. And to extend the tourism activities from coastal and urban areas to rural and interior area regions. And of course, to be the one of the top five in the top five countries considering tourism income uh, by the year 2023. And uh, this strategy got a conceptual action plan. Uh, this ex uh, this, uh, in this conceptual action plan, there are corridors, destinations, uh, some areas that are assigned uh, for a specific type of uh, tourism. As an example, uh, interior regions where the geothermal uh, sources exist here. Oh, sorry. Ah, okay. Here you can see, these areas are thermal areas. And as a destination example, here you can see the golden chain. This is the south uh, east of Turkey where the religious and gastronomic tourism uh, is assigned. And a lot of uh, tourism types that our country offers, but uh, in fact, it's it takes too much time if I try to tell all of them. So 
I am focusing on the winter and uh, mountain tourism. Uh, regarding to that, the uh, conceptual action plan offers three corridors mainly. One of them is, here you can see, so at the northeast of the Turkey, where the altitude reaches almost 5,000 uh, meters. And second one is here, where the popular ski resorts Kartalkaya and Uludağ take place. And the third one for the mountain tourism, where the Black Sea coast, along the Black Sea coast, here you can see. Now I want to give you about uh, some general facts uh, about uh, winter tourism figures. Uh, here you can see the declared winter tourism centers all over the Turkey, and as I mentioned before, uh, here you can see the, uh, most of them are located in the uh, northeast of the country. And this is uh, the list of winter tourism centers. The yellow ones, uh, we call them active tourism centers. It means that they offer uh, adequate accommodation, lifts, slopes. And the gray ones are semi-active. It means they offer uh, accommodation, uh, lifts, and slopes, but uh, not in a uh, good um, quantity. They need to be developed. And other ones are potential areas that are declared, but their planning and construction uh, processes are ongoing. And as a city planner, I should refer to the planning uh, of winter tourism centers by uh, an example. Uh, Kayseri RGS Winter Tourism uh, Center is one of our planned tourism centers. Uh, you can see the physical information. You can see the physical information of this. Uh, there are uh, 13 lifts and 21 slopes with total length of over uh, 55 kilometers. And nearest airport is Kayseri Airport is 30 kilometers away, and nearest city center Kayseri uh, 25 kilometers away. In this case, uh, the planning process begins with a master plan. Uh, the preparation of master plan is coordinated by the Kayseri uh, Metropolitan Municipality and uh, the uh, um, foreign consulting firm. And after that, uh, the Ministry of Culture and Tourism uh, find this uh, master plan appropriate and uh, made a strategic plan made and approved a, a strategic plan. After the strategic plan to implement the decisions, um, ministry uh, prepared an, uh, some impl implementation plans and design projects uh, and approved them. Um, with, with implementation plan and design projects, uh, the usage of parcels and uh, the building codes are set. And from, uh, from strategic plan to design project, this process all, uh, is all um, applied uh, by us uh, to all winter tourism centers in Turkey, but uh, not, uh, we don't have a master plan for all of the uh, winter tourism centers. And uh, lastly, I should mention about a new project of the ministry about a vision of mountain tourism in Turkey. And I should note that uh, this is a new project uh, and the idea came up by the beginning of the year. So uh, I will tell you about some objectives and main titles, but uh, that they are not finalized yet. They are not uh, completed yet. Uh, I should mention some objectives of the uh, Winter Tourism Strategy and Action Plan. Uh, to ensure plant development, to determine the investment priorities at the uh, existing city tourism centers and potential areas, and to adopt the international, uh, international standards of ski and mountain tourism to Turkey. And the main contents, uh, we especially uh, separated the uh, strategy in uh, three parts. First one is the analysis parts, uh, potential analysis that uh, includes ski potential, uh, presence of supplementary functions such as integration with other uh, tourism types, and market and feasibility analysis. And second part is a standards guide. Uh, this guide will include minimum requirements for declaration, uh, business model and safety standards. And the third one is action plan. Uh, action plan will include the conclusion of the uh, first two parts and 
uh, will include the, what uh, certain acts, definite acts uh, should be taken in uh, four fields. These are uh, planning, investments, advertising, marketing and brand management, and administrative regulations. As I'm completing my uh, presentation, I should note that this uh, is just a draft. This is uh, not a finished outline. And any contribution to this uh, project, to this study, is very welcome. Thank you for your listening. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Seneb, for um, this presentation. Um, I think we will now continue with the other presentations, uh -huh. and we will then, at the end, ask the audience whether there are any questions. Um, if there is no questions, I have um, written down some of the questions, but I would now like to give the floor to Alexander. He will tell us a little bit more about the Georgian Mountain Resorts. Okay, thank you, organizers of the conference, for giving me uh, opportunity to give the presentation. I will briefly uh, present the role of the government of Georgia uh, in the development of mountain ski resorts. Uh, okay, since 2011, <coughs> Uh, mountain ski resorts we are gradually put under the uh, management of government of Georgia. The Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia founded the governmental institution, uh, the Mountain Resource Development Company, which currently runs four Georgian mountain ski resorts, Ludauri, Bakurian, Goderzi, and Mestia. The current slide uh, uh, gives the uh, Sorry. Uh. Oh, Sasha, it's uh, it's need this pro. Oh. Okay. Okay, uh, now I want to uh, tell about the, uh, about the uh, Godauri and other, because it's another presentation here, but what can I do now? No. Uh, Sasha, I, I have a, sorry about it. <laughs> Maybe um, I would just use um, the time um, to ask a question um, to you, uh, Zeneb. Um, who will be the main um, target groups for the mountain resource in Turkey? Will it be more Turkish people, or are you expecting people from other countries to be there? Both, both of them. Okay. And um, are the Turkish um, people um, active in skiing at the moment, or is this something like a market that needs to be developed? needs to be developed and uh, with this strategic plan we plan to do something with this. Uh, maybe uh, some coordination with other institutions, with other public institutions, uh, some lessons, maybe sick lessons, some other encouragements to the uh, youth people. Okay. And um, one more question regarding the involvement of the, of the Turkish ministry. Um, how do you see the role? How long do you want to be actively involved? What should be the private side do? What should be the public uh, tasks when you develop them further? Okay. Uh, I think the beginner will be the public sector and uh, in the other side, in the um, time period after that, the public and private sector will uh, work together after that. So at the very beginning, you also plan to invest in accommodation facilities, for example? Uh, I told a uh, planning process in some uh, land allocation yeah. process. Land allocation process uh, 
provides that what you ask it. Um, we, we, pro we provide uh, land to the investors and we uh, also provide some budget to, uh, for them to build infrastructure and other things. They only just build their building, their hotel building or resort building. Mm -hmm. So there's a uh, act like that uh, by the ministry. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, uh, the company currently runs about four uh, ski resorts in Georgia. Gudauri, Bakuri, and Goderzi, and Mestia. This current slide gives the technical data of the ski resorts. The company has a competitive experience in implementation of infrastructure and innovative projects on mountain ski resort. The realized project will be discussed below. Uh, Georgia locates at the crossroad of the European and Asia. The strat strategic geo geopolitical location of Georgia has, has potential to attract foreign visitors from both Europe and in Asia. Uh, the given map shows the flight duration from the countries within the flying distance from two and two, five hours. Uh, the Georgia ski resorts are within the driving distance from neighboring populated areas starting from 2.5 million uh, to 41.5 million. Um, and, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, short period of its management, the company has complete do completed dozen uh, of infrastructure and marketing projects. According to the master plan elaborated by the Canadian company Ecozine, new ski village was created in Gudauri, which is the equipped with modern ski lifts. For instance, gondola lift and platter lift with the beginner's trailers, trails we are added to the existing ropeways. Also, I would like to mention that today we are signing the contract with the representative of Ecozine, Mr. Eric Callender, uh, on the development of detailed master plan of Gudaur, which covers all development phases. Moreover, new ski leads we are installing Goderzi, Mestia, and Vakuriani. In cooperation with the, economy, with the company Demaklenko, the artificial uh, snow systems was installed the Gudauri and Bakuriani, which is the turning point in the development of Georgian ski resorts. Uh, new summer attraction, bike parks and trails will de develop it in Bakuriani and Gudauri. In cooperation with the Slovenian company Allianz in 2015, the creation of uh, Bike park is one of the steps takes it towards the development of four season tourist destination. A kids entertainment park, tubing zone, and alpine coaster were established at the resort. Resorts. The snow park we, uh, for extreme sport lovers was constructed in Gudauri, which is the attract more visitors. For the first time, night skiing became av available in Bakurian, which prolonged a skiing day. All Georgian ski resorts are equipped with the ski data, hence free uh, access points follow allowing the company to introduce important innovations in the ski pass policy. Thanks to contactless checkpoint systems, the United Ski Pass was la launched with the, uh, which enables visitors to use one ski pass on the resorts. Informative monitors we are also installed which allows visitors to easily assess information about the operation of ski lifts, weather, altitude, and ATC. Gudauri Ski Resort's official application allows customers to find useful information about the resort, local weather, live camps, news, interactive maps, and others. Currently, we are working on the development of new version of trail maps, which French company Giot and I like to visit Mr. Martin Franco. Uh, I have uh, already uh, uh, reviewed the project implemented by the uh, Mountain Resort Development Company. Now I would like to speak about the result Georgia, uh, with the result Georgia achieved in economic development, which is directly reflected on the business sector and invest investment environment. According to the World Bank Group doing business reports, the Georgia is the number one in the Eastern Europe and Central, Central Asia in doing business and in world rankings hold position number 15. Uh, starting business number five.
dealing with construction permits number three, registry property first place, and paying, paying taxes 38th place. Important reform in business sector has boosted economic development in recent years and positioned the country of the rank of number one uh, in terms of easy doing business by the World Bank. According to the Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index for 2014, Georgia holds 50th place out of the 175 countries. Uh, according to the Heritage Foundation, Georgia has uh, registered advancement in five of the economic freedom, uh, which includes freedom from corruption, investment freedom, business freedom, the control of government spending, monetary freedom. Achieving the highest score ever in the 2005 index, Georgia has advanced farther into the category of mostly free. Georgia is ranked 11th out of the 43 countries in the Europe region, and its score is well above, above the regional average. The government of Georgia development approach towards the development of mountain ski resorts of Georgia. For, for this purpose, investment areas will be developed. The public sector provides support to the local and foreign visitors in terms of construction of commission, commission communication infrastructure and elaboration of general development plans of the resorts. Furthermore, the government of Georgia adopt new law in the development of mountain regions. The new law provides substantial economic, business, and so social benefits, which include tax exemptions for the companies operating in the mountainous regions. More opportunities and support will be available, available for infrastructure and business development in the highlands. Public-private partnership PPP represents one of the administrative measures which increase the efficiency of development of mountain ski destinations. PPP created positive condition for forested investment in Georgia ski and accommodation infrastructure. Thanks to public-private cooperation, Kohta and Bakuriani area will be fully developed for 2017. Within the framework of PPP, Government invests the construction and operation of three ski lifts and trails. Government provides investors with necessary communication and infrastructure. The Georgian company, GRDC, uh, private company, uh, invests $70 million in the construction of complex of hotels, restaurants, entertainment, and entertainment facilities. For the first phase, additionally, 80 beds will be created by the private company. The high interest of GRDC in public-private partnership is confirmed by the fact that the head of GRDC, Mr. Elemok Aralashvili, is attending the conference. And uh, uh, other, uh, on the basis of public-private cooperation, additional hotel complex uh, will be constructed by the another private companies, Orbi, Redcom, Zaurebi, and others. I have briefly uh, reviewed the steps taken by the government of Georgia towards the development of mountain ski resorts of Georgia. Additionally, I would like to underline the state plans to apply further measures for advancement of mountain resorts. Due to the fact our delegation is represented by the head of Georgian National Tourism Administration, Mr. Georgi Chogovadze. I would like to present the result achieved so the realized activities uh, for, for the state. The, high, uh, the grip shows the tendency of growing flow of tourists in Georgia and one of the most popular ski resorts in Gudauri. The majority of tourists are from the East and Central European. Uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, Hungary, uh, Russia, of course, and others, as well as the local tourists. Local tourists. The graph demonstrates how the number of real estate increased annually since 2012. Compared to 2012, the number of accommodation, including hotels, apart hotels, guest houses, and ATC, increased sharply in, the, in 2015 and reached 80 uh, percent. The policy of the government of Georgia is to keep the lowest and affordable price uh, 
on ski pass in the region in order to attract more foreign visitors. As you see in the current slide, the price is not only the lowest in the given re region, but also in European ski resorts. Uh, the future development plans, the Gudauri Kobi Ski Lift Project is a transport tourism and mountain ski project that aims to connect Gudauri with Azbeki municipality. The goal of the project is to expand ski area to the north and increase the length and capacity of the ski pistis. The construction of artificial water reservoir and snowmaking system will be additional summer attraction and create a new area for investors. Furthermore, sport, sport facilities such as the ice rink for including uh, for curling and hockey and biathlon park will be developed. Uh, will be de developed. The company is streaming for increasing popularity of Georgian ski resort. For the purpose, MRDC is planning to participate participate in international ski expos. Increase awareness of the publishing promotional articles in inter international magazines and organize uh, promotion activities. And finally, I would like to thank World Tourism Organization for giving us opportunity to host the third Euro-Asian Ski Resort Conference, which will be held in 2017 in Georgia. Thank you for your attention, and you are welcome in Georgia 2017. Thank you. Alexander, um, I was amazed by um, the price of 13 euro per uh, day um, ticket. Um, I just read, um, you're taking away the <laughs> um, I just read that yesterday um, that for this season, um, the Austrian destination of Salbach Hinterglem is the first one charging 50 euro for a day pass. So this kind of um, border of 50 euro is for the first time they exceed it next year. So 13 euro is definitely an argument why going there, yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, you didn't mention anything about um, the heli skiing uh, business. Is this something you are also are involved or is this more like a private um, business you're not involved? Yes, we have a heli ski in Georgia, uh, as the several ski resorts and it's very popular, um, and uh, I know that European is forbidden, yes, and several countries have these permits. And you, I can say that uh, heli ski is very popular in Georgia, and welcome. Is it operated by private? It's a several pri private companies. It's not state companies, yes. I should note that uh, health ski in Turkey too, not a competitive way. <laughs> you should uh, maybe, uh, sorry, uh, in Kaçkarlar, uh, mountain of Kaçkarlar, there is a health ski uh, operated by private uh, sector. I should just add, want to add that. Thank you. Um, that's definitely something um, very interesting for Europeans um, and um, a very good uh, at a very good price in comparison to going long way trips to Canada, going to Turkey or to Georgia and enjoy um, heli skiing there because um, what I have seen and what I've heard um, from people that have been there, it's really beautiful. Um, it's it's a very once in a lifetime experience and very, very interesting and very, very good. Um, now we have heard um, about the European uh, perspective. Now I would like to hand over um, to Justin to tell us a little bit about um, the Asian Chinese view on mountain resort development. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm the last speaker on the last day, so I don't know if that's good for you or bad for you, but we will find out. Um, I'm not with the government. We are a, a private business. Uh, we're in development and management of integrated resorts. Uh, I primarily focus on China, but we're a global firm. Uh, obviously, we interact with many stakeholders on a daily basis in events or, or management or government. Um, and uh, so we have a kind of a unique look at things. So my, my presentation is a little bit more general, uh, hopefully gives you some insights into how we as a private group approach things or how we view things. But I thought, I, I, uh, as some of my predecessors have used some of my material, I've been modifying as I've been going along, and I thought I'd show you a quick video to wake you up 
before we send you off for a coffee break. So uh, if we can show my, my quick video introduction to IMG, that would be great. What makes a moment great? There are the big moments, played under bright lights and an extreme close-up. And there are the smaller moments, ones that sneak up on us. There's the moment right before, when no one knows what will happen. And there's the moment right after, when no one can believe that it did. We remember the losing moments, which challenge us. And the winning ones, which renew us. If there was only the one kind and not the other, then there'd be no reason to watch. Founded in 1960, IMG has dedicated itself to these moments of greatness. Today, we're the global leader in golf, tennis, fashion, and college sports. Every year, we're involved in over 8,500 major events. We're the number one sponsorship agency, number one in licensing, number one in media production and distribution, number one in performance training. And through landmark partnerships around the world, IMG is now leading the way in India, China, Turkey, South Asia, and South America. All around the globe, in more than 130 offices and 30 countries, minute by minute, second by second, heartbeat by heartbeat, IMG is part of one great moment after another, with countless more to come. So I love this video, it actually, every time I see it, it kind of makes me happy, but uh, as we know, tourism, a sport is a huge part of all tourism, and IMG is the global leader in sports, entertainment, and media. So any resort that we're involved in, with, we bring in all of our components into the resorts that we consult to manage and help to make successful. So uh, while we're not a, a typical resort operator, we bring in other unique elements to a project. As you can see, we have, uh, and, and as was represented in the video, we cover vi pretty much every single sport uh, that's in existence. Uh, I look after the IMG Resort Division based in China, and we're focusing on the development of ski resorts, which you've heard from some of my uh, colleagues over in uh, uh, earlier these couple of past days. Uh, from my perspective, we, we do everything in a resort development uh, from right from the very start uh, in the the, the thinking, dreaming up of a concept and proving it out to planning and design right through to uh, uh, pre-opening, operational consulting, uh, ac performance academies, events, uh, anything from, from start to finish, a fully integrated uh, management and design company. Um, so I'm based in China. Uh, so I'm going to start a little bit about China. I'm going to end in China. And I'm going to talk a little bit about other places that I've been involved with in between. Uh, we all know that China's tourism is the is one that's really going to be the one that everybody watches over the, the, the next, well, decades. It certainly is now. Uh, by 2025, the World Tourism Council suggests that investment in tourism is going to overtake the USA. So there's a lot going on over the next 10 years. And we'll create over 73 million jobs in China. So tourism obviously is very important to China, but also to the rest of the world. Interestingly enough, though, uh, tourism in China only represents 3% of its GDP at the moment. This was last year. Uh, actually, in for, for this year, it's about 4%, and by 2020, it'll represent 5%. But even if you look at a more mature nation for tourism, such as the U.S., which is over 21, over 20% of its GDP, China has a long way to grow. The world average is 9. So China, as a percentage of its GDP, even as large as it is, uh, is, is still got a long way to grow to, to, uh, and can make a significant impact to its economy and to the world. Uh, leisure spending uh, at the moment, as you can see here, is continuing to grow. It's going to rise by 6.4% this year and another 6.3% uh, over the next 10 years. So the amount of volume and revenue that will come to generate new opportunities for the, the nation is going to be extensive. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, you know, it's about to, it will overtake the U.S. by 2025, but still as investment into the industry still only represents 4% of the total GDP. So huge room for, huge room for growth. Um, 
you know, ski managing ski resorts is, is, is a, a complicated uh, endeavor. It's like a huge jigsaw puzzle, and there's so many, so many different agendas. Um, in most cases, it's public land. In a lot of cases, it's public land. So therefore, there's thousands of stakeholders that have multiple opinions about what should happen with their land, what's in it for them, what they expect, what they want to protect, where it's been in their past and where it's going in their future. And some of these, some of these stakeholder inputs or desires, whether they're government or private or personal, um, are not. Con are, some of them are consistent with ski resort development, and some of them, quite frankly, are not. So, it's it's how to how to move forward when you've got so many different agendas. The great debate really is 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 the resort a sustainable use of the land, and therefore, what is the what it, what is the definition of sustainability to any person? As developers, which uh, I've been on the development side of the business for a great portion of my career, we're always accused of taking something away from the environment. We've got beautiful trees, beautiful lakes, animals, flowers, whatever you like, and we're always accused of taking it away and building, building infrastructure, building roads, building buildings, and basically taking away from nature, uh, which is in a lot, a lot of cases that's true. But what the developers uh, of this generation, and certainly what our focus is, is Yes, while we're taking, maybe taking something away, what are we doing to actually improve it at the same time? And that is the, the number one uh, objective of us as developers now is to not be taking, but how to give and how to make it a legacy for the community and for the environment. It's all about a balance. And what do we do as a developer to balance everybody's expectations and create a harmony with the environment? Because if there is harmony with the environment, in general, the resort can succeed. If there starts to be an imbalance with the environment, then there's a very good chance it will fail. Um, we all know that ski areas can bring significant la uh, benefits to the public and to the government and to us as the operator. Um, it grows, it, thousands and thousands of jobs come as a result of what we do on a daily basis. It promotes uh, a happier, healthier lifestyle, and, and actually is, it was with this platform that the Chinese government was successful in getting the support of the Olympic Committee and for the, obviously the general Chinese public is that creating lifestyle and leisure activities in the mountains is actually going to bring a health, healthier and happier and more vibrant economy and, and, and public. So the government recognizes the benefit of this. Um, therefore, around the world, and in China even now as well, it's, it's trying to encourage responsive and effective policies. So they're developing policies that are encouraging growth while trying to balance the uh, environmental and social economic concerns, but needing to change as the, as the, uh, the, the local environment grows. The interesting thing is, in a lot of cases, demand pushes supply. But in the ski industry, it's my opinion that supply actually drives demand. And it really requires the encouragement of the investor, the encouragement of the government to invest continually into our resort products. Generally, um, uh, obviously, assets depreciate over a fairly long period of time. But if you don't continue to improve your product, and eventually the customer starts losing interest and will start moving on to something that has a greater appeal to them, that's more interesting, that's of a higher quality. So the government and the, and the developer continue to need to invest and to push and develop and improve their local product. There's ongoing developments uh, around the world and certainly in anybody's neighborhood where there's competition for leisure spending. Um, so th the operators need to continue to make well-programmed sequential, sequential investments in their developments in order to make them sustainable. Otherwise, just market will erode. Um, no one wants to see a ski area close, and obviously there's been many countries around the world where uh, investments where investment hasn't been put in, the market, er, the market uh, population has started to decline, and ultimately ski areas get closed down. So it's about creating a controlled development where there's uh, an, an enough market supply and enough market demand and keep that in balance. You know, if a resort closed down, local communities are often devastated, huge unemployment. Um, you know, in several, several resorts around the world, they've had to completely reinvent themselves because tourism has evaporated. Um, Obviously, un unemployment leads to significant social economic problems, and no one wants to see that. So it's not in the interest of the government or the ski, ski area operator or for the public or the public to see a ski area closed. So it, it co we're constantly encouraging our developers to continue to invest and improve their product. And 
what I didn't mention, obviously, is we need to continue to invest in the fact that climate change and other external economic uh, conditions are going to affect our business as we grow, so we need to continue to adapt. Um, looking at a couple of other uh, areas, I spent a few years managing resorts in Australia before moving up to China. And when I first moved to Australia, people thought, well, somebody said, is there snow in Korea? Well, the first thing was, was there snow in Australia? Well, Australia actually has a very vibrant ski industry, which was surprising to me as well, given that I was actually born there. Um, but uh, the government has a heavy involvement in the, uh, in, in the development and the management of the industry. Their day-to-day -day operations have a, have a, a significant government influence. Um, but the key is, is that Australians, that the Australian government knows that Australians love to recreate, they love to travel. And that if we don't provide and keep those services at a high quality within, within Australia, they're going to go overseas for it. So why let, that, why let all those revenue dollars and, and taxation dollars go overseas? So they continue to support the industry in Australia. It continues to be a viable and, uh, and successful economy because the government is, recognizes we need to keep Australians traveling within Australia. The, uh, the governor of uh, Colorado is actually in Beijing right now, and, and we've been handling some of his activities, and I asked him for his comment, and basically his first comment was that public, public benefits of ski area operations don't end with economics. I asked him for one statement, and that's all he gave me. But uh, um, basically he says it is one of the most significant drivers of his platform in his state and it's the second most popular recreational activity using their parklands behind hiking, so I guess in a similar way to Korea here. Um, and they fully recognize that if we get people out being active, if we get people engaging with the environment, then we have a happier, more vibrant economy. And that's the, that's the full platform that, that he supports. So he's out in China right now trying to encourage investment into Colorado, encouraging tourism into Colorado to experience the benefits of what Colorado's, Colorado has created over many decades. In Canada, uh, which is where, where I call my hometown, or my home country, uh, British Columbia specifically, the government has a, a slightly different way of looking at uh, resort, uh, resort development. We have five main, air, five main ways where the resorts are categorized, um, with the, with the least, pop, with the, with the least uh, abundant one being on private lands. But basically, the crown lands uh, are, are obviously heavily rec regulated by the provincial government. And there's very successful policies that are being put in place to ensure that resorts do not get overdeveloped. Uh, that the, the balance of infrastructure going into the resort keeps balance with the developer's desire to sell real estate. Obviously, a lot of resorts are real estate driven. So uh, there's a very, uh, very uh, important formula that most of the resorts have to follow by provincial law that if they want to put in more real estate developments, they have to invest in the skiing infrastructure to be able to have access to those bed developments. Um, so it's all about keeping pace and making sure that one does outweigh the other and we end up with a white elephant with real estate and too much real estate, no buyers and no lifts. In China, I won't uh, go into this uh, in too much because uh, Benny mentioned some of this stuff before. Obviously, there's huge opportunity for growth in the industry. The Chinese government is heavily supporting uh, all sports at the moment and certainly winter sports with the coming of the Olympics. But at the moment, the ski population represents less than 1% of the population, which is 1.4 well, billion people, so it's a pretty small market. Uh, you know, in Korea, you have, a very high, you have a very high participation rate in skiing for a relatively small population. And in Japan, huge per, uh, uh, penetration into the market um, at its heyday and is still very high considering the decline in the population. Um, but over the, next, over the next seven years, you know, we, we see the opportunity for the, popula the ski population in China to grow to up to 25 million people. So still a relatively small percentage, but at the same time, it is a, a, a very interesting market. It's all about organic growth. Uh, like I mentioned before, it's about trying to keep the pace of the development. And you know, uh, while Benny's uh, project Wanda in Chambaishan is a very unique development, actually globally, it's very rare that you will see a company that will do a 10-year development plan and do it in one year. Uh, they were very successful in doing it, but a lot of other places around the world, and certainly in China, can't do that. So it, it's about the sequential investment to build the momentum, to build the quality of the operation, to grow the, the confidence in the product, and 
allowing the resorts to grow organically. The government has trouble doing this in China because they build roads to nowhere and airports with nothing at the end of them and then encourage developers to go there. And in other cases, developers are building stuff in the middle of nowhere with customers, no way to get to them. So it's really about organic growth and that's where the government right now is focusing its attention on how to do things with a proper methodical plan. The positive factors for the Chinese uh, ski industry is that investment confidence is very high. There's no shortage of money. Uh, all of the international brands are now looking to come in from a hotel perspective, whereas you know, eight years ago, I couldn't get one single hotel group to look at one of our resorts. Now every hotel group wants to be in all of the resorts. Um, the growth of the income, obviously, is, is indisputable. That's well known around the world. We won the Olympics. You know, that's a, a, a fantastic boon for all of us, for the, for the global industry, not just the Chinese industry. And the good thing is, is that China has the ability to put into place any regulation it wants. It doesn't require any public consultation. They can do whatever they want. But if you look at the flip side of that, uh, the negative factors is, is that the government has an inability to regulate, which also slows us down. So as Benny mentioned and uh, some others have mentioned, we have uh, a, a significant lack of uh, safety protocols. While, while the industry is safe, there's not a lot of regulation to look after things like ski patrol or, or education like ski instruction. And these things have been coming for years and years and years, and the government needs to regulate them, otherwise the developers can just do whatever they like. So while it's good that they can regulate, they also need to hurry up and put the regulations in place to build the confidence. Um, and as we know, uh, we've mentioned a few times, the lack of repeat skiers in the country is a si significant problem. Uh, even with 1.4 billion people, if they only ski once, then the industry will finish at some point. <laughs> so. um, the Olympic, Olympics, obviously, we've, we've talked about a lot, and this was already mentioned before, but as I said, is that the, we have less than 1% of the population is skiing in China at the moment. With Xi Jinping's grand statement of getting over 300 million people, that'll lift us to over 21%. So we've got a lot to do in China at the moment, so we welcome uh, all outside support, and uh, you know, we're always looking for input and expertise and motivation to help us get to where we need to be. It's a long path. Sports in general, because IMG, we're focused in, in many areas of sport. Uh, if you look at uh, the economic data of 2012, China's, China's uh, uh, revenue numbers were about 158 billion. But by 2025, we'll be at 800 billion. So we're talking about uh, you know, multiple, uh, multiple increments of growth over the next several years. So not just in skiing, not just in winter sports, but in all sports. Chinese people are going to become happier, healthier, and more engaged with the outdoor environment. They will travel, they will buy things, they will buy shoes, they will buy backpacks, they will buy tents, they will get involved in everything. So it's a huge opportunity. And finally, we all know about legacies. Uh, we as developers need to leave a legacy to our resorts, uh, uh, to our communities. The Olympics needs to leave a legacy to the nation. And for Beijing, we're going to, the, it's always been a government strategy, but the Olympics will make this happen as we will integrate the key cities of Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei province, which I think puts us over uh, uh, 70 million people, which will be a totally integrated city area. We'll finally be able to squash the, the monkey on our back, which is pollution, uh, because that is a, a key mandate by the government that this will be solved. This in turn will help our leisure and tourism. Um, and we will have unrivaled new roads, aviation, and high-speed rail. And at the end of the day, which is good for everybody here, is we'll have happier, healthier people. And they will travel the world, and they will experience all of your places. And we will have a continued sustainable tourism industry to grow. But it's a collaboration of everybody. So no one organization can do it themselves. The government can't do it themselves. A country can't do it by themselves. It requires global collaboration by multiple associations. And all we want is successful, viable, long-term future for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justin, for this uh, contribution. Um, I have a question um, regarding the involvement of the public authorities in the development of mountain resource. I mean, as I understood, the majority of the Chinese mountain resource are private investment, more in the direction of real estate development, but are there also some public investment into mountain resource? Well, there are uh, several 
uh, state-owned enterprises that are investing into resort developments. I mean, I think the state-owned enterprises are probably the largest employer in the country. I'm not sure of the number. But uh, many of the big state-owned, you know, power, utility, telecommunication, airline companies are investing into resort development. So indirectly, there is government investment. The majority of the large-scale developments are certainly private. And they're certainly playing a real estate game. But the good thing is, is that uh, the, the large-scale uh, Chinese developers actually have the financial runway to build it to the scale, perhaps, that, that Wanda has built and be able to ride it out until the market catches up, whereas in a lot of countries, other countries, that's just not possible. And the real estate game, is it paying off for the investors at the moment, or is it more like a long-term strategy? Uh, if, if you asked me that two years ago, I would have said absolutely not. It is not paying off, but it's starting to catch up now. And uh, in certain areas, uh, we'll be more successful than others. Uh, in the area, obviously, where the Beijing Winter Olympics will be held in, uh, for the uh, Alpine Cluster and Zhang uh, you know, real estate is selling like crazy, and the prices are going are, are doubled since the announcement was made, and it will continue to go that way. In other more destination locations, it's still going to be a little bit slower for that uptake, but people are growing to be interested. But it's the the resorts are not making money from real estate now; uh, it's purely an operations game at the moment. One last question uh, from my side regarding China. Um, Everybody is curious how to attract Chinese people to go to mountain resource. You have been in operations of mountain resource in China. So can you maybe give us some hints? How do you attract them and how do you make them come back to one particular mountain resource? Well, I'd love to, I'd love to say there's a science to it. Um, the Chinese skier is a little bit different, I think, and I can't compare to, to Koreans, unfortunately, uh, as far as other Asian preferences. Um, you know, the, the Chinese traveler, at least from my perspective, are not going to places for seven or ten days where perhaps we would as, uh, as uh, North Americans or Europeans uh, tend to be going to places for shorter stays. And they're looking for a, a much more diverse type of experience within a resort other than just pure skiing. So as a, as a North American or an Australian, perhaps, we might uh, we pay $100 for our ticket and we want to ski every single minute. Whereas the, the Chinese traveler is actually not looking to do that. They're looking for a variety of, of experiences, whether it's dining or other forms of entertainment or non-ski activity. So it's, a, it's much more of a resort than it is just a ski resort, I think, is, is the key point. Um, I think Chinese, uh, just purely by the history of who's been marketing themselves in China, European resorts tend to be uh, more appealing because they're, they've always been positioned as the most glamorous. So North American resorts are now catching up, and the Japanese resorts are certainly becoming interesting because now it's that next step up from kind of skiing in a, in a groomed run, no snow environment to actually testing their powder prowess, so to speak. And are the people also going there in the summertime, or is it purely a winter game? Uh, Actually, it, from, from everything that I'm told, and we deal with a number of uh, resorts in, in Canada and the U.S., is the majority of their visitors are actually coming in the summertime. So they want to experience mountain resorts, but they're not there to ski. That is growing, but it's still, I, if I had to put a percentage on it, I would say out of every 100 people going to a uh, ski resort, probably 15 of them are going for skiing and the rest of them are going for something else. And I would like to ask the audience if there are any questions to the panelists. We still have 15 minutes, if you like. Where's the microphone? Yeah, it's coming. Thank you for your presentation and uh, Basically, I do have uh, two questions, one for uh, Mr. You know, uh, Hinterweger, yes. and uh, another one for you know, Justin uh, Downies. Uh, for you, you know, Mr. Hinter, Hintertager, and uh, I think you, you know, uh, in your area, you know, 
Austria, you developed a lot of alpine tourism. I'm especially interested in a uh, uh, alpine wellness tourism. Have you uh, heard about that? Or this is the first time you hear you know, alpine wellness tourism? You just think about it. And then I'll give you a couple of minutes, and then I'll <laughs> ask uh, Justin Downey uh, other questions. All of the panelists, when you prepare your presentation, uh, you prepare your presentation, the, you know, you know uh, lack of information about the Yongnam Alpers. But now you stayed here in a couple of days, uh, since yesterday. I think you understand the, the circumstance of Yongnam Alpers. We are, uh, our, our mountain here is kind of a uh, baby mountain, you know, around the uh, 1,000 you know, meters comparing with the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Matahon or, you know, uh, Yungpura or, you know, uh, Mont Blanc in uh, Switzerland, I mean, uh, your country. This is a small mountain. And then on top of that, the snow, as I mentioned earlier, our, the quality, I mean, quantity of snow is a very little quantity. And then also the time we hold the snow is not a very long time, less than four weeks or five weeks. So, uh, you know, put all things considered. Could you, uh, you know, recommend any, uh, you know, uh, proposal to, to be a, uh, you know, four season destination here uh, in Ulsan area, please? Especially, you know, Justin, you're a, uh, you know, uh, you know consultant and then also you are based in China uh, because you are pretty well know about the uh, you know Asian cultures and development. So please. <laughs> um, just uh, to make sure that I understood it correctly, you said um, it's wellness, alpine wellness, yeah. or well is well, well. wellness spa. You mean? Yeah, yeah, of course I'm familiar with this. I mean, um, this is something like, like a trend over the last um, couple of years in general in Europe, uh, this spa and wellness trend. And of course, you can also have um, corresponding products um, in the Alpine region and in the mountain resource. So this is definitely something that is being developed. Some particular mountain destinations are focusing on this kind of tourism product. And yeah, I've heard about it. Is there any, uh, you think personally has a uh, possibility apply those concepts to Yongnam Alpes? Because we have a uh, Dungok, you know, hot springs, very famous, and then Kaunol hot springs. We have uh, hot springs, mountains, and, uh, you know, uh, we have a whole populations living around here. Absolutely, I'm very positive about this, um, because I think that the combination of activity and active, yeah, with hiking and these trails and everything that we have seen um, in other sessions in combination with uh, natural resources like hot springs and wellness and spa, um, this could be something very interesting. And you have one big advantage that you have highly populated um, big cities very close. So those two topics that are generally working in many destinations, but when the population is not there, you need to get a lot of people going there. But you have the people already here. So absolutely, I think um, there is a potential to develop this kind of business here. Well, I have to apologize. It, uh, it's my first time to come to this area. And I got here at uh, 10.30 on the first night of the conference. So I haven't had a chance to explore it it with my own eyes what the opportunity is here, but everything that I've seen and read and heard is that I have to believe that there is significant opportunity. It's, it's about finding the balance between uh, culture, sport, and entertainment. And I always believe that there is something that can be found to create that, but not just one thing. It's the blend of a variety of elements that attract a broad variety of people. And Chinese, uh, if we just talk about Chinese interest in Korea, there's always been an interest both in both directions of Koreans going to China, China is coming here. Um, in a way, it's about differentiating the product from anywhere else, such as Jeju Island, where perhaps most Chinese would first think of going. So, uh, you know, I, I, without doing a little bit more research, I'd, uh, I, I'd be cautious to give any particular examples, but I'm certain that there's some opportunity. Thank you for your answers. 
there were some more questions in the f yeah something喂你好 而建设和提升的两个大型滑雪场，但是大东会结束，大东会和亚东会结束以后，他们的经营并不太理想。这方面想听听你的建议。第二，呃，中国举办2002年冬奥会，对我们中国人来说确实是一个很兴奋的事情
If we're going to do anything, it's about breeding workers that want to make this a career and not just a part-time job. And that's what I'm most passionate about, is how do we infuse that into our business uh, to make people love it. And I think that is what's going to boost the industry. One last question on the gentleman in the first row. Yes, yes, yes. Ah. Could, could you give the microphone? To the gentleman in the first row. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, those uh, presenters also uh, address the ski resort and the ski development. And uh, my first question goes to how long does it last, like a uh, ski season in your countries? Uh, the reason I'm asking this question is quite different from Korea. We have uh, maybe uh, December, January, February, maybe three months uh, at most. But in European countries, um, they even they have uh, some uh, summer skiing season. So your circumstances and the Korean environment is quite different. So uh, my question is, the first one is uh, like a length of a ski season and uh, how do you operate during the, those ski resort during off season? What kind of activity do you provide to your customers, et cetera? Thank you. We start um, telling you a little bit about Austria or the Alpine region. Let, let, let me focus on Austria. Um, the length of the ski season, usually the majority uh, of the mountain resource starts their skiing season by December. Yeah, and it's until the end of March, maybe middle of April, depending when there is Easter holidays. They sometimes you know, um, combine this and take this. But usually I would say it's more or less four months like the main winter season. Of course, we have glaciers, and there you can um, ski um, all year round. Um, but the majority of the mountain resource, I would say, it's like four months approximately on average. Um, for the ropeway companies, um, the majority of the revenue they are making definitely during the skiing season. Yeah, um, They have, of course, the main gondolas also operating during the summer season, and there are an increasing number of people going to the mountain resource in the summertime. Nevertheless, from a percentage of the revenue, we are talking about maybe on average 10 to 20 percent of revenue in the summer season and 80 percent during the winter season. The same applies to the accommodation facilities. I'm only talking about average. There are always exceptions that are doing a very good job in the summertime. But um, the same uh, applies to the accommodation facilities. Usually, um, the prices for the same kind of accommodation yeah, is only half or a third of the prices they charge in the winter time during the summer time. Um, of course, um, what, what, what was the main reason why a lot of development took place in the mountain resource in Austria over the last um, couple of years was that the ropeway companies wanted to increase their revenue. So they have created attractions, in the majority of the cases, very close to the mountain station, so that the people want to use the ropeway also during the summertime. And this is why a lot of summer development took place. Um, yeah, I hope this answers your question, and I will um, hand over. OK, in my country, in our ski resort, Uh, in Turkey, the ski season lasts for uh, four months. Uh, most of the ski resorts are closed all the winter, all the uh, summer, uh, but 10 percentage of them uh, operated their uh, resorts for football camping. Um, there are some football um, stats and uh, activities uh, during the summer, but it is uh, not much more uh, than uh, four uh, resorts. Okay, uh, uh, for our uh, ski resorts, we opening in uh, 5 December this year, and maybe we closed uh, end of April, about 25, 20 April. And summer season, we started June, July, August, and uh, middle of September, uh, it's over. It's summer season in our ski resorts, and uh, we have an attractive that, um, attraction about uh, toboggan, uh, hiking. Uh, um, uh, uh, now we uh, have a, 
aqua, aqua park and other things for people, for visitors. I'll, I'll just uh, speak to China. Um, most of the uh, most of the resorts, in theory, can be open before the end of November and go, can go right through until the end of March, uh, some perhaps into early April. So it's a fairly traditional ski season. As most people know, we don't get a lot of natural snow, so it's really reliant on snowmaking uh, and the temperatures, which are typically very reliable uh, in the Northeast specifically. So that the season can be very well predicted. Um, much like in uh, North America or Europe after Easter, things tend to tail off regardless of when Easter is. Well, the same thing applies in China and how that relates to Chinese New Year. Uh, so each year is a slightly different season. Most of the resorts do not have much of a summer operation. Um, uh, and that's specifically the ones around the city, they, they more or less just close for the summer. Now the new destination resorts, uh, some that you've heard about today, like uh, or this week about Wanda or Taiwu or Genting or, or Vanka's project in Jilin, uh, these are developing summer activities. And to be honest, most of the resort, most of the people in the Chinese cities are dying to get out of the cities during the summer because it's hot and it's smoggy, and they want to get out into the mountains. And, to, and until recently, there's been nowhere for them to go. So now that we have the roads and the rail and the, and the resorts, the things at the end of the roads for people to go, people are starting to go there. But the biggest challenge at the moment is China's two biggest national holidays. One of, it, one of them's in the winter, being Chinese New Year, and one of them's in the fall, being uh, the national holiday in October. And that's when the country puts 1.4 billion people on holiday all at the same time, making it impossible to go anywhere. So it's really going to require a bit of a strategy by the government over the years coming to allow more flexible work schedules so that people can start to get out and enjoy the facilities during the, the April to November period and not just be stuck in with the typical holiday period. Thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, for asking all the questions. It's now 4 o'clock, um, so if you have any um, additional questions, please, please feel free to um, approach each of us um, now during the coffee break. Um, I think we will now have half an hour of coffee break and then we will have like the wrap up uh, session and the closing ceremony. Thank you very much for the panelists and thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please give the moderator and panelists a big round of applause for what was a very wonderful last session. And as uh, Mr. Hinteregger mentioned, we're going to take a 30-minute coffee break. And at 4.30, we're going to begin the last part of our program. So enjoy your coffee break, and I will see everyone here at half past four. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. For those who do not know me, I am Esen. I'm the director for the Destination Management Department in the World Tourism Organization. And uh, actually, we, we are the ones who organize this with my dear colleague, Sasha. Now, good afternoon. Now, we are here to close our conference, which we fully trust, by all means, has achieved its objectives. And before I address my introductory remarks, very few words, I am pleased to welcome here two distinguished gentlemen. Uh, first, Mr. Lee Chi Hoin who is the Vice Mayor of Ulsan Metropolitan City. <laughs> and
and Mr. Park Yong Chu, who is the chairman of Ulsan City Council. Very welcome. Well, just a few remarks, if you allow me, about the, uh, the conference. Well, I, we believe that we, during the last couple of days, we've been listening to 33 experts, or cases, I must say, representing 14 countries from the different parts of Europe and from some countries in Asia Pacific. And also we heard some words, some positioning uh, um, paper, I must say, from some decision makers yesterday during the first session who explained how they approach the mountain tourism within the framework of all the tourism sector in their country. I think that it has been a, a great learning and knowledge sharing experience for us. We had more than 200 participants, thank you all. And all these participants, they came from more than 30 countries. Um, I think that we had the opportunity to clearly identify the new paradigms, I call them new paradigms, in terms of demand and supply as regards mountain tourism. And I believe that we had the opportunity to think out of the box to, to some extent during this conference. Also, we tried to review once again the challenges of the mature traditional mountain destinations, the majority of which are in Europe, and also the potential and the opportunities that the emerging destinations and mountain resorts are facing in this part of the world. So this was our aim, and I think we fulfilled this objective. But the mature destinations, we have observed that they are still making efforts to maintain or improve their market share in the global marketplace. And the new the emerging destinations, they are also making efforts to achieve their goals in the, within the new uh, patterns, demand patterns, and uh, what is going on in, in, in the world. So we also, uh, uh, we also observed that both need to adapt to change. So there is some change going on, and both of them, the mature destinations and the emerging ones, they have to adapt to change. And this has to be done in a very smart manner. And this has to be done in a process of still competition, which we call uh, cooperating while competing. Because our aim is to create this platform so that you can exchange experience and knowledge and so that you can compete while cooperating uh, on, on many issues. Uh, both the mature ones and the emerging destinations, they both want to achieve competitiveness. What do we mean by competitiveness? They want to improve their competitiveness. Some want to be competitive. Competitiveness is not the concept of figures. Competitiveness means sustainability. Competitiveness means quality. It means inclusiveness. It means effective governance and management structures and procedures. It means innovation. It means return on investment. It means reliable research and reliable data. So there are other factors that we, we can count depending on, on what you, we want to achieve. But we, when we want to be competitive, it doesn't mean that we have so many arrivals in our mountain destinations. This is not our criterion for competitiveness. So I will not go longer than this because you know that all events, all conferences like this must have a, a take-home message. So this take-home message will be given by our dear friend Christopher now. He will make a, a summary of the highlighted issues during this conference so that when we go back to our countries and offices, we have some something to to reconsider and to um, think of when we are rejuvenating 
our mountain destinations, I must say. So it is my pleasure to, to give the floor to Christopher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, I will not repeat all the things that have been said during the last two days, but um, I decided to um, focus on the main highlight key messages of all the sessions. So session one, we started with setting the scene paradigm shift in mountain resource. What are the differences between um, the European development process and model and the Asian development or process model? Um, we heard from Laurent that the mountain resource industry has reached a mature stage in Europe while the Asian market is booming. But it's also not um, that all the countries in the Asia, on the Asian market um, are booming. It's mainly China that is having a significant Ah, this is okay. 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 Thank you very much. Um, it's mainly China that is the driving force behind this development, while um, in South Korea and Japan um, the story is a little bit different. We of course have different business models uh, regarding the development of mountain resource. We have a very fragmented. Um, business model in Europe with a lot of different owners, um, the rope companies, um, the owners of the hotels, the infrastructure owners, um, more privately driven development, and we have more an integrated development model in Asia. Another um, differentiating factor is that the Asian mountain uh, resource often close to big cities. So therefore, there is a high percentage of one-day visits and therefore, in uh, Asian mountain resource, it's often not so important to have a significant number of accommodation facilities, while the European mountain resource are mainly resort types um, where you really go there and stay overnight. China is a very uh, special market, high potential, but at the same time, um, currently 90% um, of the skiers are beginners, and um, they are there searching for a one-time, one-in-lifetime experience. So um, at the moment, there is not a market for repeating skiers, uh, visitors to mountain resource. This is something that might change uh, in, the, in, in the upcoming years uh, in the framework of the Olympic Games, but we will see how this will develop. Nevertheless, um, the Chinese market is one market to watch um, for those who are involved on the Chinese mountain resource market, but also for um, mountain resource abroad, trying to win Chinese visitors. Uh, we heard from Sean Mark um, that the expectations of the Russian skiers and snowboarders are very similar to the European ones. Um, there is not much difference, although the amount of uh, snowboarders is significantly higher than in Europe, uh, reaching almost 50%, um, at least in Krasnaya Poliano and in the area of Sochi. And then, of course, we heard that um, in South Korea there is an increasing health awareness, and um, yeah, this is um, kind of stressed by the fact that 30% of the South Koreans are hikers, and there is an increasing uh, bike sale. So this is definitely something that plays into the hand of mountain resort development. Session two. Mountains as the city's hinterland. Um, those mountain resorts located very close to the city has the, have the advantage um, that they can generate a um, significant number of one-day visitors, and they are not so forced um, to develop accommodation facilities. Um, we have heard that uh, besides numerous positive effects, um, the tourism can also have negative impact on small destinations. We heard Adam um, from Queenstown telling us very honestly um, how um, difficult it sometimes is um, to deal with mass tourism in a very small town. Um, this is especially getting critical um, if the amount of visitors by far outnumber the amount of inhabitants of the city. Also, mountains um, in close proximity to larger um, cities offer the chance for several development options. Uh, we heard the case from Canberra from Ian, um, where they have developed a very, very modern, professional, large, um, bike park, so to say, where they can do uh, downhill, mountain biking, uh, BMX, so all these kind of uh, activities. Without a lot of investment for accommodation, nevertheless, the main in investment at the very beginning came from the public side. 
Grenoble then was a good example. Eve um, told us a little bit about it. Uh, this combination of being a business hub, but at the same time a leisure destination, and how important it is to connect the city center or the city itself with the mountains. And this is the main goal to achieve very good and easy accessibility. Then we had session three, mega events, a unique opportunity to capitalize on global attention. Um, the topic was very controversially discussed. Um, big events are often definitely an accelerator to infrastructure development in a destination, not particularly um, the only reason why there is an investment in infrastructure, uh, but it maybe makes it faster that um, this development takes place at an earlier stage. And of course, this is also for the benefit of the local people after the event. Um, another key message was um, that the Olympic Games in Beijing will inspire more, or it's aimed at to inspire more than 300 million Chinese to get active in winter sports. This is a key message, I would say, because this can change demand patterns in the region and in China in particular. We also heard that the post-event strategy is often difficult, but a must for a destination hosting a big event um, because you will have to face a lot of issues after the big event. Um, we um, heard about um, different Olympic Games um, destinations and their problems with the infrastructure afterwards um, because sometimes to maintain and to operate um, the sport venues and the sport infrastructure after the Olympic Games or after the big event um, is quite costly and definitely there needs to be a plan how to um, deal with the situation already before the event takes place. For 2018, South Korea will be the host of the Olympic Winter Games. Um, we heard that um, there are basically three strategies um, regarding the preparation for the Olympic Games. The first one is development, the second one accommodation management, and the third one marketing, which is a very clever approach. Not all Olympic um, destinations in the past uh, really um, implemented it in a way you uh, South Koreans are planning it, and I think um, it makes much sense to um, use uh, a big event like the Olympic game to increase marketing efforts, to increase the efforts regarding image creation, um, to promote um, the products of South Korea also abroad. So if this um, strategy is, will be implemented, I'm very positive um, that um, you will have a lot of positive effects after the Olympic Games as well, and not only through media coverage. Session four today, the first session of today, um, accessible and inclusive tourism in mountain resource. Um, we uh, saw amazing pictures of Fideto, um, who was traveling to many, many different countries, 144, I remember, um, and without sometimes knowing um, what to expect. And this is something he was raising as a main issue, that more information should be provided and more information is necessary um, for um, people that um, are handicapped in a way and want to still travel, whether they can access certain sites or destinations or they cannot. Um, it's also a good point when you're planning a tourism attraction or a big event uh, to already take accessibility into consideration. Um, we have heard from Florian uh, from Kaunertal that um, it's not very expensive to think about this before the planning and implementation process, but afterwards um, sometimes to convert it um, into an accessible um, facility is often cost intensive and time intensive. Um, destinations should aim to fulfill accessibility along the tourism service chain, so we are not only talking about the actual time in the destination, but also the time before going there, the search, then the booking, then the transportation towards there, the arriving, and then the departure. So um, all this um, kind of value chain of tourism should be taken into consideration. Um, with the right supportive uh, equipment, um, it is possible um, for people with impairment to do a lot of things we saw today. Um, 
And this is definitely a market for the future for many destinations uh, because the number of people uh, willing to travel um, is tremendous and you should not uh, forget that they not travel alone but they always take families, friends or they travel in groups so we are talking about um, substantial um, figures. So it's definitely something especially for smaller destinations in the future to differentiate from main competitors. Session number five was about product development, diversification and innovation. Um, we saw a presentation about the South Korean hiking trail. Um, there is a definitely growing demand for hiking and walking trails. Uh, could be long distance or could be uh, shorter seamed ones. Um, we also have several examples from Europe where they are have already have been implemented in the last couple of years um, where sometimes you can go for um, I don't know two or three weeks uh, of course you can also uh, make shorter uh, day trips um, but the, the product um, is definitely a good one and the market is definitely there. Demographic change and decreasing ski population forces Japan to attract more foreign visits um, that's interesting um, that they have the capacities and um, Japan needs to somehow fill these capacities and because the demand, the domestic demand is not growing, it is decreasing, they need to think about how to attract um, foreigners to fill the gap. Um, due to the further segmentation, former niche markets get attractive for mountain resource like extreme sports or those competitions um, where leisure athletes go and um, participate in a certain event. The development of alternative winter and summer tourism products is growing in importance. Of course, we all want to have a four season resort at the end of the day because this is from an economic point of view very uh, important. And then of course you have to think about alternative winter products and summer tourism products to bring the people there and to make them to spend money. There is an increasing need to optimize the skiing experience in mountain resorts. So even those in mature markets, they can still um, improve their services by making accessibility easier and faster to pay more attention to beginners and all those kind of actions. New mountain resort destinations increase global competition. Yeah, this is one side of the medal. The other one is uh, it offers also many chances. New destinations like Shadakh um, will create new skiers and those skiers might once also want to go to the Alpine region to other regions so of course the competition is getting harder among mountain resource but on the other hand um, it also offers the chance um, to create new target markets. The last session of today was about effective governance and policy instruments we saw that it is very necessary to have a proactive approach from the public side. Uh, this is an important success factor for mountain resource development in Europe. It's very investment intensive and therefore needs public support in majority of the cases um, where you don't have big institutional investors investing into the mountain resource. We saw the cases of Turkey and of Georgia, how they are dealing with this and how they try to find a way um, to realize um, a development, a sustainable and professional development in a form of public-private partnership. So some parts the public side will do and some parts the private side is expected to invest. Um, favorable framework conditions needs to be set up by the public authorities to support successful development, of course. And what was interesting for me is that um, actually Justin told us that the investment in tourism in China will overtake that in the US by 2025. This is also something I think is very remarkable. Important for the public administrations is to create development in harmony with the environment, uh, create a development in harmony with the environment. This is especially true where new greenfield developments are popping up, where sometimes environmental issues um, are raised and their public authorities need to find a balance between the environmental issues and the business driven model of developing a mountain resource. Um, this is in a nutshell, or those are in a nutshell, the most important key messages of the last two days. Um, it was my pleasure to do these um, final remarks here and um, I would 
like to end my presentation with one of the sayings or quotations from the very first day, mountains are the very beginning and very end of everything, and mountain resource will definitely have a good future and uh, a lot of new mountain resource will be developed in the future, and um, I hope that the whole industry will um, develop in a positive way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christopher, for this very comprehensive and very brief, very uh, comprehensive uh, conclusions. Well, I would just like to remind you that all the presentations will shortly be incorporated in our website, uh, probably next week, and also the conclusions will be there. So, uh, and if you need further information, we are more than happy to, to provide you with further information. Just uh, one thing that I forgot to introduce you, uh, one other distinguished gentleman, uh, who is also a co-host, sorry for, for uh, because I was just recently informed that he's here. He's Mr. Kim Ki-hun, who is the executive director of Korea Tourism Organization. So, he's also here. Thank you. So, uh, may I invite now uh, uh, our vice mayor of Ulsan Metropolitan City, Mr. Li Chi Hoin to address his uh, final remarks. Thank you. <웃음> 네, 여러분 반갑습니다. 아, 어제 오늘에 걸쳐서 어, 산악 전문가들이 모여서 세계 산악 관광 이슈와 미래에 대한 여섯 번의 주제 토론이 열렸습니다. 참여해 주신 모든 분들께 진심으로 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 관광 산업의 발전은 세계 경제에 기여함은 물론이고 세계인이 서로의 문화를 이해하고 존중하는 데큰 역할을 하리라고 생각합니다. 이번 회의를 통해서 우리는 산악 관광이 가진 무한한 역동성과 잠재력 그리고 가능성을 확인할 수 있었습니다. 이를 계기로 산악 관광이 관광 산업에서 차지하는 중요성이 한층 더 높아질 것으로 기대하고 있습니다. 내외 기빈 여러분, 대한민국은 예로부터 비단의 수를 놓은 듯이 아름다운 산과 강이 있다고 해서 금수강산이라고 불려왔습니다. 한때 전쟁과 관할로 인해서 헐벗은 민, 민둥산으로 변한 적이 있긴 했습니다만은 짧은 시간 내에 울창한 숲으로 다시 가꾸어 냈습니다. 자연의 소중함을 알기에 이번 산악 관광 회의에 남다른 감회를 느낍니다. 자연이 만든 생명의 근원인 산은 나라와 지역 인종을 초월해서 감동과 희망을 주는 가치와 매력을 가지고 있습니다. 이러한 점에서 울산시에서는 세계 5대 알프스 중 하나인 영남 알프스를 세계적인 산악 관광지로 발돋움하기 위한 꿈을 펼쳐 나가고 있습니다. 수로와, 수루한 풍광과 어울려 이루어지는 다양한 산악 레포츠와 국제 산악 영화제, 억새 축제 등 관광 인프라를 늘리고 있고 UNWTO와 세계 알프스 도시 협의회 등 국제적인 협조 체제도 공고히 할 것입니다. 우리는 울산에서 산악 관광 번영의 동반자로서 깊은 우정과 신뢰를 쌓았습니다. 이번 회의를 계기로 해서 울산이 국제적인 산악 관광 도시로 도약할 수 있도록 많은 관심과 협조를 부탁드립니다. 내외 기빈 여러분, 세계 최고의 권위를 가진 UNWTO가 주최하는 산악 관광 회의를 울산에서 개최할 수 있도록 지원해 주신 관계자와 내외 기빈 여러분께 다시 한번 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 내일 진행되는 테크니컬 투어를 통해서 울산의 문화와 산업 그리고 영남 알프스의 아름다움을 마음껏 느끼고 돌아가시기 바랍니다. 모든 분의 건강과 가정의 행복을 기원합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much.
much, Vice Mayor. Now, may I invite uh, Mr. Park Yong Ju? Uh, he is the chairman of Ulsan Metropolitan City Council. Yes, Mr. Ju. Yeah, uh, UN-WTO 진심 어린 감사를 드립니다. 관광 산업은 청년 산업으로서 세계 모든 나라들이 관심을 갖고 지속적으로 투자하고 있는 고부가 가치 산업입니다. 특히 산악 관광은 관광 산업의 더 나은 미래를 열어 나갈 핵심 동력입니다. 그런 만큼 이번 회의가 산악 관광지의 밝은 미래 조성이라는 공통의 관심사를 허심탄의 이야기하는 토론의 장이 되었을 것으로 확신합니다. 아울러 단기적인 실천 과제는 물론 중장기적인 발전 방안도 심도 있게 논의되었을 것으로 기대합니다. 우리 울산은 산악 관광의 발전을 위해 더욱 노력할 것이며 세계 산악 관광도 시와 함께 경험을 공유하는 데도 앞장설 것입니다. 짧은 일정 속에서도 알찬 성과와 결실을 내주신 모든 분들의 노고에 거듭 감사드리며 여러분의 앞날에 건강과 행복이 가득하시길 기원 드립니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we are almost closing our conference. Well, at the outset, on behalf of the World Tourism Organization, uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the Metropolitan City of Ulsan, to KTO, to the Ministry, and to all our colleagues who have been personally engaged in the preparatory work for this conference. And they've been working for months and months to make uh, this conference uh, a big uh, success. Uh, I also express my gratitude and appreciation to all the speakers, all the moderators. They have really uh, shared a lot of information. We are also in a learning process as the Secretariat. We learned a lot from them as well. And I would like to thank the interpreters who have done a very, very difficult task uh, during the last couple of days. And to all of you who have been here, who have been very patient, who have been very uh, who have attended until the end of this conference, actually. And uh, we had more than 200 uh, people, by the way. So this was really, we consider it uh, quite a success. And I'm sure all of you will take uh, uh, good memories from this amazing city, uh, to your offices, to your friends, to your family. And last but not least, we look forward to meeting you all next March in Andorra, during the, for the next uh, World Congress on Snow and Mountain Tourism. It is on, again, mountain likers, and the subject will be on sports and adventure tourism this time. And I would also like to inform you that shortly we will have a publication in the UNWTO Secretariat for sale, of course. Uh, this is on mountain tourism, so we have compiled what we had in the past from all the expertise and all the experiences and knowledge from the past events and past um, field studies, what we have. So thank you once again. Thank you, Director. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Director Terzi Basoglu and all of the speakers another big round of applause. Thank you.
We've come to the end of our program, and before I let you go, there are a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, there is a farewell dinner that will begin at 6 o'clock sharp, so please be prompt. Uh, it will be held in uh, the room where you had the luncheon, uh, Charlotte room number three. And at the Lodi department store, the department store that is located right next to the hotel, uh, there is a square there, and apparently they have a lot of promotions and exhibition events regarding our conference that is taking place, and they are open until 6 o'clock, so I think we have uh, some time for you to go and visit uh, the square. And also, I'm sure you've noticed, but we've been uh, hosting a best photo contest. And so I hope everyone put their sticker on the photo that they like the best. And they have selected 10 winners. And the 10 winners are going to receive a prize. So please go outside and check to see if you are one of those 10 winners because uh, the Secretariat has prepared a gift for you. So if you are a winner, please make sure you stop by the Secretariat to claim your prize. Well, with that said, ladies and gentlemen, I am now going to really close uh, the second Euro-Asian Mountain Resorts Conference. I would like to once again thank you for your active participation. Thank you.